Hello and welcome to the Emerging Technologies Resilient Healthcare panel discussion. My name is Dr. Shamis Omara and I have a background in mechanical engineering, specifically computational fluid dynamics for enclosed spaces. But I am really keen to hear this discussion that we're going to have today on emerging technologies in healthcare. Please note that we will be recording today's event, which will be made available on the Academy's website. And I also want to add a little note that I'm not about to phone a friend. I'm on my phone today because we had an iPhone uh, breakdown. And so I'm using this phone as a guide today. Um, today, you're going to hear from a panel of the Academy's Chair in Emerging Technologies. These highly prestigious awards identify global research visionaries who are leading major research research translation and innovation programs around key emerging technologies. These efforts are to facilitate technology commercialization and the creation of significant UK economic and social benefit. The panel will share their experiences of what it takes to create a resilient healthcare system, the application of their novel engineering technologies and the benefits to society and the economy. The panelists today are Professor Susan Rosser, Professor of Synthetic Biology at the University of Edinburgh, Professor Timothy Dennison, Professor of Engineering Science at the University of Oxford, Professor Peter Lee, Professor of Material Science at University College London, and Professor Alejandro Frangi, Diamond Jubilee Chair in Computational Medicine at the University of Leeds. Welcome to you all. It's great to see you. And great to be here in person. So can we start by each one of you introducing yourself? You've got about three minutes and could you tell us what area of expertise you have, uh, the technologies you're developing and what the intended impact of your emerging technologies will be? So Susan, we'll start with you. Sure, good evening. Uh, it's great to be here. It's going to be a really interesting panel discussion. So my area is uh, engineering biology. So I engineer cells, mm -hmm. biosystems, rather than nuts and bolts. So they're sort of squishy and, uh, you know, it's not what you would traditionally think of an engineer, but they're still using an engineering approach to engineer biology. So the kind of uh, research that my group do is we're developing new tools and technologies to try and make genetic engineering easier. So try and make tools that we can use to go in and edit the genome of cells, that we can um, put in new genes into systems, into cells that didn't exist there before. And the kind of applications that we're looking at are, it's a big range actually. So my group works on mammalian systems, yeast, uh, bacteria. So in the, mammal the mammalian area, we're interested in engineering cells to produce biologic drugs, for example. So biologic drugs are protein drugs. The chemistry is too complicated to make by chemical processes. We have to use cells to produce those biologic drugs. And so they're expensive. So what we're trying to do is trying to genetically engineer the, the cells to produce those biologic drugs cheaper, quicker, and get a, um, a, a better drug at the end of the day. We also try and engineer um, and microbial systems to produce things that they wouldn't normally produce, whether that be um, platform chemicals for plastic production or antibiotics. And so it's the same kind of approaches where we're going in and change the genetics of, of, of the systems. And so we use genetic tools to do that, but we also use um, large robotic platforms. So we're interested in automation of biology so that we can take DNA sequences, we can design the DNA in silico, and then get that DNA synthesized uh, chemically, and then put it into the cells to engineer the cells to do something they wouldn't normally do. And we have a large robotic platform available to do that, to, to put, make a whole variety of different cells, and then we can select them, select the ones that we uh, do what we want to do. And so that's kind of broadly the area that I work in. Incredible, thank you. So thank you. Uh, it's good to see everyone. So I work in the area of electronics and how it interfaces with the nervous system. And that includes both implantable technologies as well as minimally invasive systems. Um, something you may have seen before in the past has been, say, a cardiac pacemaker. We're work, working on systems very much like a brain pacemaker and other ways to actually stimulate the brain um, using, say, electromagnetic fields to actually couple in and excite the nervous system. A big push for us right now 
is to use existing therapy devices and add instrumentation on them that allows us to do clinical neuroscience with neuroscientists and uh, physicians, and then learn about disease processes and how we might uh, apply electrical stimulation to treat the symptoms of the disease. And ultimately someday we'd like to come up with, um, as some would say in quotes, a functional cure. So not really a true cure, but similar to a cardiac pacemaker, restore you to a much more uh, natural life. So the applications we're currently looking at with our clinical partners across the United Kingdom include chronic pain, childhood epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, and also a recent grant in looking at disorders of consciousness. And so that's kind of the span of technologies. And one thing to think about is very similar to a computer and then the software that runs on it, kind of a mental model for what we do is to think about the hardware platform, the electronic system for the body, and then we think of specific software programs that are related, related to the disease state. Thanks, Tim. Peter? Thank you, Trini. So the technology that we work on is out of manufacturing, which is really 3D printing, primarily of metals. And what we do is design implants, which could be a knee implant, a shoulder implant to replace a joint, or it can be printing a nano sensor that goes inside of that implant to measure the strain or bacteria level within that implant. A lot of what we actually do though, is not just uh, going through and making these implants, it's characterizing how they're made using a synchrotron. A synchrotron is um, a source of x-rays. You accelerate electrons up to near the speed of our light, and then you bend them. And when you bend them, they shed electromagnetic elect uh, energy on a wavelength, which can be anywhere from infrared to hard x-ray. We mainly use the hard x-ray and we probe inside of the material as we're making these 3D prints. And that lets us characterize them and go through and improve them and look at things such as also after they've been implanted in the body, look at the efficacy of bone ingrowth. In fact, it's uh, very interesting that we're talking about resilient healthcare and that it's not just resilient healthcare, these engineering techniques are resilient as well. They're transformable and they can be adapted. And that's one thing we did with this characterization with the synchrotron. We adapted it at the beginning of COVID. I got a call from two medics in Germany who wanted to really quantify the damage that COVID does on our lungs and our other internal organs. And we adapted it so that we can entire organs, such as the lung, which are 200 millimeters in diameter, we can zoom in and see with one micron um, voxel size, see how COVID has changed the vasculature and done all this. We did it within COVID in order to get new insights and help the medics. So I think there's resilience in healthcare and resilience in the underlying engineering techniques as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Peter. Alex. Yeah. So thanks, Julie. So the work I, I do in, is in the intersection between in, um, engineering and, and medicine, and in particular computer science and medicine. So what we are trying to develop is tools for building based on imaging and sensing data uh, computational models, um, particularly about uh, parts of organ systems like vasculature and the heart in particular, and then to develop models of virtual implantation of medical devices so we can understand in a computational way in silico we call as as counterpart of in vitro and in vivo um, the influence of that device into the performance that we are trying to achieve like for instance if it's a, a stand we want to divert the flow so how, how good we are in doing that and how good we are in promoting coagulation for instance and then utilizing that to characterize the performance of devices and engineer better devices as well. And in the context of um, resilience, that is the topic today as well, is can we generate scenarios of testing and performance of those devices that will be either unethical or impractical to generate in, in a real clinical study, but nevertheless could occur naturally when you test devices in a, a well, when you go to the market with devices, so you might test in 1,000, 2,000 patients, but when you implant them at scale, uh, you may end up finding circumstances that you never try them for. So actually how to anticipate those failure modes and, and potentially design to be resilient to those. Right, so you've met all of our panelists and now that you've been introduced, uh, I'd like to invite you to think of questions that you would like to ask our panel. For those of you who are connecting with us remotely, you can submit your queue 
your questions via the Q&A functionality that you'll see on your screen. And I'm going to bring in questions around uh, 640, 1840 GMT. And so any questions that you have, please do submit via that button. Uh, we also have a small live audience here with us today who can jump in and ask questions whenever they arise. We've got microphones roaming around. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand and I'll call on you. I really want this discussion to be as interactive as possible. So we are here to talk about emerging technologies um, and resilient healthcare. So to kick us off, I want to hear your perspectives on what you believe are emerging technologies in your areas of expertise. So who would like to jump in first? All eyes are on Peter. So I, ah, I'd okay. be happy to, to kick off. So um, I think the biggest challenge to me is the convergence of technologies. So not always each of them individually are necessarily completely new, but it's the fact that we are developing more complex systems that are integrating like, for instance, if I take the work that I do, it builds on artificial intelligence, it builds on computational mechanics, it builds potentially on, on uh, device design uh, and many other disciplines, each of which you know, has developments and that are new. But I think what we are coming is to a point where all the systems we are developing in healthcare tend to be very complex. And that is always an opportunity for failure, right? Because in any, in any system, you know, what, what limits its performance or limits its behavior is the weakest link. And as the systems become more complex, it's very difficult to anticipate which is going to be that weakest link at a given point in time. Um, so for instance, as I, as I mentioned before, you might design a device thinking that you have considered all possible scenarios. And when you implant the device and then you realize this is very, very good and that it stays on the body for 10, 15 years, that device may be, may be hosted in a, in a body that has conditions that were never present when you implied it in the first place. And anticipating that and, and understanding the consequence of that, you know, is, is potentially at that point the weakest link, right? Um, so for me, um, the aspect of resilience here is the ability to anticipate those weakest links, I'd anticipate the scenarios of failure early on. And particularly in the healthcare domain, I think what makes it very different to say man-made objects um, like automotive industry and, 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 and another type of transport, for instance, is that we, in those areas, we tend to design for tolerance. We want to develop all the pieces to be exactly the same. While in, in healthcare, we might want to have the devices all equal, but the problem is that the persons we're going to implant them are all different. And it's how you design systems so that they can be robust to those um, changes and those variabilities that you, you simply cannot anticipate a priori. And following on from that, actually, so the ultimate aim of my chair in emerging technologies is to build designer cells that can sense the disease state, sense the different biomarkers that are present, compute that information within the cell, and then produce a therapeutic. So the idea would be that you'd implant these cells into, into a person, to be really the ultimate personalized medicine, and that they'd be able to sense you know, compute and then produce a therapeutic where it's needed, when it's needed, and in the right amount that is needed. And to make that a reality, then we also have to bring together a whole range of different technologies and emerging technologies. And so for us, you know, DNA sequencing has now become very cheap, so we can get a huge amount of information from that. Synthesizing DNA, writing DNA is also becoming very cheap so we can now actually build a whole lot of different genetic circuits that can do that and we've got the automation of beginning to get the automation that we can actually put these things together and into cells and, and select the ones that do what we want to do but all within also a computational framework so we can in silico try and build these designs and then put them in the cells but so that actually the ultimate aim is not to sort of treat disease but to sort of maintain wellness have that resilience so that if somebody's starts getting ill, then the cells will be able to sense that and then treat that before they actually become ill. One thing on that that's interesting is from a very high level kind of system thinking, the technology I'm working on is very much akin to that from the standpoint of building sensors, thinking about control algorithms, and then how do we modify an actuator? So each of the building blocks are, of course, different, but it, from a generic, here's the signal flow. There's a lot of similarities. 
Now, one of the things that we find in terms of the element of resilience and things we think about is the body being so nonlinear. And so, you know, so for those in the audience, you know, we were all joking. We looked up resilience on the train here, make sure we had the right definition kind of, but my analogy is a rubber band. And so oftentimes when we're engineering things, we think about small perturbations. And so you pull the rubber band, it kind of slightly goes back until it snaps. And so the thing that we think of very carefully about in the area I am is looking for snaps. Um, and an example, two that have come up that are interesting, we think about the mitigations. I'd be curious how you mitigate for these kind of events is we'll slowly turn up a stimulator and say we're trying to treat epilepsy, we'll suppress the neural network. But if we go a little bit too far, we actually do just the opposite. We can actually induce a seizure event. And so we think about how do we design a control algorithm to put limit stops, if you will, in place. And the other one I think is fascinating. Everyone can, everyone shares this experience. And so it's a good example. Many of the control algorithms were worked out in very small time windows during the day when a, a patient would come in and enroll as a subject in a trial and try out a closed loop for an hour. The problem is it didn't include sleep. And so then it was pushed out into the real world and into clinical trials. All of a sudden, the sleep, the sleep rhythms in your brain can be quite different than the ones that you see during the day. And that's another example of the resilience and think about some of the nonlinear properties. So we spend a lot of time on the technologies, not just designing what we want to go right, but actually putting safety guardrails all around the design for when they might go wrong and what do we do about those. Biology is messy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting because the, the technology that we're developing with the European synchrotron radiation facility and their new extremely brilliant source is trying to actually do a scout and zoom. So because if you do put a cell in some area or you put a device, you can look at where it's affecting that region or that particular attribute of the cell, but what's happening with your other organs. And so what we're trying to do is a technology that lets you scout and zoom so you can go through and see the interaction and the effect across the different organs for just that resilience technique. We need to understand the broader impact. And then what we think when you're asking Shini about new technology, a big aspect of it is using machine learning and AI to actually scale across the technique. So we can take a technique that is very high in radiation dose, so it can't be used clinically, and map it onto standard clinical techniques and try and interpret, or map it onto laboratory techniques like some of the other people in the audience are working on to go through and as a, as a regular laboratory clinical tool. And I think that resilience needs to take in that all those different hierarchical scales from the cell to the device to the whole organism that we are. Yeah. I mean, in listening to all of you, like you're, you're approaching it from such different perspectives, but the common thread is the amount of data you must be generating to get this understanding. I mean, the weakest link, as you talk about, must be hardware, surely. I think it's, it's, it's data, but it's also the variability of the sources of the data and the experimental conditions in which that has been measured. Um, like, for instance, if we are looking into the example I was providing of, of a stent in a, in a vessel, um, you might be able to, to characterize the experimental properties, mechanical properties of the vessel ex vivo, but that might be very, very different to the ones you have in, in vivo conditions, or it might be, you know, as stiff as a uh, you know, patient gets older or, you know, change under hypertension conditions. So in, in the context of artificial intelligence, machine learning, we call domain adaptation to that ability to, to understand how the statistical distributions of, you know, properties in this case, um, change as we change the domain, or we change the conditions. Um, in, in the case that Peter was saying is, you know, when you change observational scales, for instance. Um, and I think resilience to those changes is very important. And I think one of the, the ways to tackle that is by, uh, you know, we are in a world that is very much data-driven, or we are trying to promote a data-driven approach to a lot of things nowadays. But I think it's very important to go back to the first principles because they provide us the rules, the laws, the, the, the yeah, first principles, fundamental from physics, from uh, other disciplines that allow us to put priors in the way we interpret the data. And we know that those priors, the physical laws, will, will um, be valid within certain ranges of observational scales or, or, or instruments that we may have. So how you combine these data-driven versus more mechanistic-driven approaches 
uh, I think is one of the, the keys to overcome some of these um, aspects of, of, well, to make systems more resilient and more, more robust to, to domain changes or domain shifts as an economy. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that this big data is not just a problem for the hardware, it's also for the interpretation. So we're getting all sorts of new data and, and the technique we're using, we're going from the micron scale and identifying some individual cells, but really going up in a scale and using x-rays to look at soft tissue, where normally it's just used for bone and hard tissue. Mm -hmm. And so we're showing it to radiologists who just aren't used to seeing things on that scale. And so getting that time to interpret it and to go through what are petabytes of data is really, really difficult because you need expertise to interpret it, to then train a machine learning or an AI system. And so it's not just the machines, it's actually the expertise and the people to go through and interpret it. One, one thing that's critical that Alex brought up was the notion of priors. This is, I guess, my caution. Things I think about with resilience on data is to make sure that we're sampling this space of, say, physiology um, when we're doing our data collection and, say, training, training an algorithm to be run in a clinic, when in reality the space might be this big. And being very cautious to extrapolate outside of this zone because of the nonlinearities of physiology and some of the other unknown interactions. And so that's my caution, like we were talking before uh, this meeting about not just the data, but being very mindful of what biases might be in that data collection that could cause harm or some unintended consequence outside of the, the context of which it was gathered. This is actually, Alex and I were talking about the nice thing about in silico trials is it can be very hard to expand the space. So it's easy to say, but it can be very challenging. But say in the design of MRI systems that are actually on the market today, you know, to run a clinical trial and try to capture every permutation of how those leads in the device might be, be placed is in, almost impossible. When you're doing those in an silico trial, you can actually run a million perturbations. You can you know, place the device and the leads in a number of per different permutations and then that gives you actually more confidence from that in silico trial once it's validated than you'd have from a clinical trial alone. And so that's my one caution on data to be very wary of the limitations or biases you might have in your collection set. Same principle applies when we do an outlook. You know, when we're looking at cells, we usually grow them up in a, in a flask or whatever. So you're actually looking as well at the population level rather than at a single cell level. So, you know, within that population, you have massive variations. So you're not actually getting a, a good picture data-wise and to get high quality biological data even at the cellular level is, is extremely challenging. And, you know, within resilience in the cells, we're often actually fighting against the resilience of the cell. So we're doing things to the cell that it wouldn't normally do. So, you know, the cell doesn't necessarily want to produce a whole load of an antibody. So, you know, the cells then actually try to sort of like stop us doing what we want to do, to do and go back to its sort of natural state. So we sort of like fighting against the resilience of the cell. But, you know, the data that we regener generate is you know, enabling us to try and make mathematical models to be able to predict how the cells could behave under different conditions, et cetera. But it, it is extremely challenging. And then we try to, you know, build that data into sort of feedback loops to try and control what the cells do. And there's, uh, there's members in the audience here who you know, applying control theory to, to biological systems. And you know, that's a really, a really important area for engineering biology. Can I come back and challenge you, Alex and Tim? Um, I completely agree that the in silico is great when you're looking at normal tissue or in normal variation. But when we look at disease tissue at these scales, it's just so different that I can't see how you'd have programmed an in silico model to go through. And so I think you have to have that clinical because it can completely disrupt your structures and it must do the same at a cellular level. How do you accommodate that in these in silico simulations? Yeah, I think to be frank, it's, it's not very different whether you do in silico or in vivo models. You're always making assumptions about what is the mechanisms underneath. I mean, the the difference with a computational approach is that it forces to declare your assumptions a priori. So you need to code them and therefore you're being more explicit about them. So in a sense, it's a lot more transparent and explainable in a sense. So there are, there are for instance, I don't work so much in that area, but I know that there are certain models of cancer that you can, 
for instance, you can develop them. You could, for instance, look at how um, as the tumor sort of uh, grows, what would be the minimal resolution that you will need in an imaging system to pick up those changes. So it might be useful in terms of understanding the minimal specifications that you need in, for instance, in, in a sensor to, to, to pick up that signal. Um, I think the, the other element that, that, that I think is quite important coming to the question about emerging technologies, I, I wouldn't call this a technology necessarily, but the it, it, it domain that is developing is uncertainty. So being able to, um, to quantify and to, and to understand how the uncertainty in the different components that we do understand propagates in, in, in decision-making in healthcare or in the biological systems we are developing or in the imaging systems we are developing. Uh, that I think is quite important because we tend to think, think we, you know, being in the UK, we are familiar to how much we can rely on the weather forecast, right? But sometimes we take decisions in healthcare as, as really deterministic, you know, as things that, you know, if the doctor says, or if an scanner says this, it must be that, when in fact we know that there is a certain uncertainty in it, right? So one of the directions in which I think we need to progress is in, in developing building in more in every decision that we build in the, in the healthcare system or in any um, measurement that we can pro we provide um, a sense of how much we can rely on that. And I think that will aid into the interpretation, which I think is the other aspect that you were mentioning, uh, Peter, before, at least in, in, in those things which are measurement driven. Well, one of the things I really uh, was asking about was that a disease might cause some change in the physics that you haven't thought of incorporating in the model. Yeah. And so how do you actually go through to do that? Do you need to just look at a huge number of samples and cross-correlate it? Or do we try and just plug in each physics and run it through and see what's a viable change of biology? Yeah, I, th I think it's, <clears throat> it's probably um, almost like a dialogue between experiments and the computational elements. I, I wouldn't imagine, for instance, in silico trials to be a complete replacement of clinical trials. But what you will do is sometimes find uh, you know, uh, have observations clinically that you cannot explain with your current understanding. So you may be able to postulate different hypotheses about what might be driving those observations in a computational way. And sometimes you may do predictions through models that you don't really know why they might be, but it might guide your further experiments. So the way I see it is an interplay between these two disciplines as opposed to one replacing the other one. Yeah, it's a, it's a great clarifying point. Actually, my choice of using MRI as the example from my own experience, is it captures Maxwell's equations very well. And so it's basically laws of physics that we fairly well understood. And that's where it's been successful in, in my experience. Extrapolating into, say, modeling an epileptic network and then using that to give absolute confidence in an algorithm, that I think is still very much an evolving area. So and that's based on where is the state of the scientific understanding at this time and how we would relate it to an algorithm. So there we're still very much relying on in vivo characterization, either in preclinical models or in clinical studies. And so it's, I'd say the continuum is where do we have confidence in the baseline physics, biophysics, how it applies to the situation. What gives me hope is that in the area of um, treating diabetes, they have a very good biophysical model, the pancreas, they can look at the, the way that the body is responding to sugars and insulin levels and the like. And through that, they've created basically models of different disease states. And so when you have a new algorithm concept, you can run it against these models based on biophysical principles that are understood and it gives confidence in those algorithms. But then my space of brain um, diseases, brain disorders, we're still not quite at that stage yet. That's a very good point to bring up. It seems as though uh, emerging technologies is calling for resilience because new techniques are being devised, uh, new strategies um, for approaching things. And it's all, you know, to your point, Susan, about cells becoming more resilient to the techniques. It's, yeah. It's a tension, isn't it, between you know, forcing them to do something that they wouldn't actually do and then trying to bounce back into being a liver cell or just wanting to grow. So with what you are working on, what are the challenges that you're facing currently? I think the, one of the main challenges is that we can design a, system, a genetic circuit, a system that we put into a cell 
and then it simply doesn't do what we hoped it would do. So then you've got to go back and redesign it and go again. Or it will work for a certain amount of time and then stop working. And that's something that industry finds as well. So it's a big issue with sort of scale up of biological technologies. So if you want to get cells to produce something, uh, for example, monoclonal antibodies, if you want Chinese hamster ovary cells, which is the cell type that industry uses to produce monoclonal antibodies, quite often they will do it for a certain time period and then they will just stop. And that there could be many reasons for that. It could be that the gene that you've put in that makes the antibody get silenced, the chromatin the structure, the DNA structure bunches up and then the gene is suppressed, doesn't do what you wanted to do. Or it could be that they would it throws out a chunk of its chromosome or it could be that it develops a point mutation. So in biology, so we're actually fighting against that thing called evolution <laughs> as well. Do you know what I mean? So with selective pressures mm. and, and then the cells will change. And again, this speaks to the, sort of the population dynamics that's going on. So that's very complex in itself. Mm. So those are the, the big challenges. So what one of the things we try and do is we try and build in um, surface cell feedback loops. So if, if you get an enhanced toxic product, then you might want to damp down the expression of the genes that are producing it. So you can try and have an internal feedback loop that sort of stops doing, you know, calms the cell down, makes it go back to its more natural state. So it reduces the burden. Or you might actually want, in the case of if you're trying to produce monoclonal antibodies, you might actually want the cells that are not producing the antibody anymore, you might just want them to die because you don't want them to be producing um, you don't want them to be sort of taking up nutrients and stopping cells that are actually producing the thing that you want to do. You know, so you try and manage the cells by introducing <coughs> in vivo, in, in, in internal biosensors to the cell to try and train them and keep them doing what you want them to do rather than what the cell naturally wants to do. Biology is messy. Messy. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for Susan actually is, do you think there is any, any bio-inspiration we can get in the way? You were saying that we are fighting against the resilience of the biological systems. Is there something we can learn from there to develop engineering systems to be resilient? I think that's a, that's a really interesting question, actually. I think one of the things that the biological systems have is that diversity in, within the population. So some of the cells will do, you know, some of the cells will have that resilience and do what you want them to do, some of them won't. And I don't know if, if you could, I think that with, a, I, you know, with engineering, this is like a, a mechanical engineer, then you haven't, you've got, you've not necessarily got that diversity within your system. You haven't got that messiness. And I think there's something to be said for messiness <laughs> that you can actually learn from. It's interesting. You, what you're, you're jogging in my, my head is this, there's a, there's a device out, actually, you might have seen it um, in the newspapers over the last 48 hours. It's the, a Neuropace RNS, a responsive neurostimulator, where a group was using it to explore treatments for depression. But the base system is actually treating for epilepsy. And the neurologists weren't sure quite exactly how to use this new technology. It came out about a decade ago. But no one's actually been doing closed loop you know, signals from the brain to control stimulation, try to prevent seizures. So the diversity has been actually getting out into the patient population. So there are safety bounds to actually built into the device to limit stimulation and prevent uh, side effects. But now with several thousand patients and all the data coming in, kind of keeping track of what are the parameter sets? What are the characteristics of the patient's brains? How do they respond? that are now actually through that diversity, able to look, you know, just the diversity of how clinicians are using the device to identify, oh, these might actually be the optimal ways to treat people. And we can benefit as a society from the learnings of kind of deploying these devices out into the uh, patient population. So your, your story reminded me of that. It's interesting. We had a great example of learning from that diversity. In the very first out of manufacturing um, joint replacements I worked with with a company, they first made them and they made them with a regular lath uh, structure on the outside so the bone would not grow nice and open. They took it to surgeons and to, um, said, well, isn't this great? This costs $500 more per joint. And they said, why? This looks man-made. Then went and just randomized the nodes inside the lattice so that they're 30% random. And the surgeons suddenly, because it looked more like bone, were willing to pay the extra 500. But we then went and did the mechanical testing and 
it is about five times stronger by the failure of the modes. Because if you, you think, if you've got four regular struts and one fails, the load on the other three goes up by, by 50% of them each, a third each. Uh, where if you randomize them like trabecular bone and they're all offset, it works out that when one goes, the load is distributed over around 20 around it. So you actually only have a 20th of the load distributed onto each other. So again, that we have that ability to absolutely, that randomness and that diversity is really important. And we need to think how we can adapt that into our engineering techniques. Mm. Yeah, that would certainly improve resilience. So then in terms of breakthroughs, um, where are you at? question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you as soon as it comes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so in, in our case, <clears throat> one of the things um, that I'm working on is in trying to understand these trials in, as, as a system rather than only focusing on developing each of the components, which is what I've been doing for the last, say, 20 years. Um, is to, to demonstrate the benefit of the system uh, in, in terms of comparing them with conventional trials. Um, and what, we, what is coming out as a conclusion of, of, those, of this work is that we are able to replicate the results from, so we recently published a paper where we compare one in silico approach to a particular type of device with the three conventional trials that were in the literature. And we show that we could replicate those results but also find explanations for certain failure modes that the literature didn't explain. Um, and we also could understand certain scenarios where you could have prescribed that device that we are currently not prescribing it. Um, so in that sense, um, now what we need to do, this is you know, what my journey is in the coming years is to replicate that sort of evaluation in a number of devices to show that this is not just for this particular device, but is, is a general benefit that, that comes from, from this approach. And what I hope as well is to, to influence regulators to start adopting more of those um, approaches in, as part of the, of the armory, let's say, for testing devices, not as a single approach, but as part of that, with the hope to reduce the amount of conventional trials that are needed that, that fail, and the ones we do to be more refined and, and, and accurate, because we can estimate the magnitude of the effects we want to, to, to evaluate, right? Mm. Any other sort of milestone I think the biggest breakthrough we've had recently, which um, has come through, is that uh, the medics that we're working with, who's initiated this characterization technique at ESRF that we're working with, um, really thought that the angiogenesis or the finest blood vessels when you have COVID might be altered. And if you look at a biopsy in a lung, it's about a, about a ten thousandth of the volume of the lung that you're looking at in an individual biopsy. And they weren't really finding what they're doing. But with the technique we're doing, where we can look at the whole lung and then zoom in and find all the way down to the finest blood vessels, we found that it does indeed, and we're hopefully publishing this, well, it's accepted, it'll be published in the next couple of weeks, that there is a cross-linking of those finest vessels. And so where you have two, two different vascular systems, two different blood systems in your lung, one to feed the tissue, so the tissue can go through and pump. The second is to actually be oxygenated. COVID appears to actually cause the two systems to cross-link. And so if the oxygen, instead of the oxygenated blood going back and through your heart and around the body, actually goes to locally in the tissue. And so that it's actually feeding instead the COVID, which is replicating there. That's what the medics are saying. And so having that ability to see the entire organ and then zoom into particular areas where you know things are happening, lets you give really new insights and go through. It's also showing the diversity because it's not all areas, it's a huge range of behavior. Mm -hmm. A promising area I alluded to earlier, I won't, I won't say it's a breakthrough, it's a breakthrough in the making, I hope. Um, it's, it's a, it can be a bit of a tortuous process sometimes in the device space. But we're starting to ask as a community, how are the brain stimulators, which we really focused on, you can think about when you go in to see and get your checkup, it's during the day. What is it doing to people's sleep patterns? And in many disease states, we find that the brain stimulators, when they're on, seem to help with sleep. But yet there's also a significant number of disease states where it seems to work against and prevent healthy sleep. 
And because of the relationship between sleep and sleep issues and many of the um, chronic disorders that we see from you know, depression, chronic pain, dementia, we're starting to say, can we actually use this new insight in terms of brain stimulation and its impact on sleep to perhaps go and treat more than just the immediate daytime symptom, but actually get to a more fundamental physiological manipulation and enhance sleep properties. And that might be a new angle for us to actually improve outcomes beyond just symptom management to perhaps, and this is aspirational, but perhaps actually impact the progression of the disease by breaking this kind of virtuous, well, non-virtuous feedback loop between poor sleep and then disease progression. <laughs> we can use our technology to try to break in there. I think probably the thing we're having most fun with at the minute is developing a series of switches at the sort of DNA level, RNA level, and protein level so that we can switch on cellular functions when we choose to buy either out of a small molecule or certain timing at certain points in cell division. So it's, it's that con actual control of cellular processes and different mechanisms for performing that control function. Wonderful. So it's 6.42, which means that we are now into question time. And I know that we have a few questions that have come in remotely. If there's anyone in the audience that has a burning question, please do raise your hand and I will call on you. Um, so just wait for those questions to come through. So the first question we have is for Peter. Um, how has your chair in emerging technology pivoted in response to COVID? It, it's been an amazing roller coaster ride, actually. So it was in um, the end of March, just after the first lockdown, that I got a phone call to go say, can you use these technologies that you're using to image? And I had done imaging with biomaterials. In fact, with Molly Stevens, who's in the audience, and others on biomaterials before in vascular systems. Can you zoom into the finest? And that really kicked off a roller coaster ride of working with both diamond light source, so synchrotron here in the UK, and with the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility to, during the midst of lockdown, rebuild technology, repurpose beam lines to actually go and, and resolve these fine changes and try and get statistical numbers, what's happening, and also try and compare it to other diseases so that you can hopefully then think what medicines worked for that other disease and, and impose on this. So for me, it's been transformational and opening up a whole new, for me, me, a whole new area of insight and working with medics around the world, which has been incredible insights. Brilliant. So Susan, a question for you. Can we learn, no, sorry, what can we learn from genetics in the development of therapeutics to tackle how diseases affect people differently? For example, an early warning system if biological, of biological threats. Is the question about biological threats as in emergent diseases or as a system of the, what's the question about? What do you want? Yeah, <laughs> yes. exactly. <laughs> So what we can learn about emergent diseases, I suppose, is if you've got something in the, in, the, in, the, in the plant that can pick up certain biomarkers, then most diseases don't have a single biomarker. They have a combination of diff things that are going on in the body, whether they be sort of different pHs, whether they be different proteins being released, whether they be in DNA released actually into the bloodstream, and cells respond to their environment and what's going on. And so... You've, you would try and have multiple disease biomarkers. It wouldn't be just one thing. And so you can look at, you could certainly be able to differentiate the ratios of these things. And you might be able to determine something from that about disease state. If they're talking about sort of emergent pathogens, et cetera, then uh, engineering biology can be used to build biosensors for viruses, bacteria, et cetera. So there's a lot of work going on. Um, there's some work going on in Edinburgh, actually, to build cells that can um, actually sense the presence of different flu viruses, for example, and then give an electronic output. So the, the cell sense, the cell surface would have protein on it that if 
a, a bioplastic comes into contact with it, you get an electronic signal out to that. So you could potentially use it as like uh, in a room, you could see if there's various particles in the air. And this, the cells that they're using are actually sort of fish gill cells, which have an amazing capacity to just survive in, um, you know, in, in an environment, you know, a room environment. So there's those kind of approaches. I think maybe that answers the question. <laughs> um, from the audience, it seems a key challenge to taking Synbio technology to bedside. Is our ability, inability to predict system level outcome? How can we integrate internal safeguards to ensure the designer cells are reliable and efficacious in the long term? Well, that's going back to the question about trying to sort of like fight against, uh, you know, their sort of resilience, if you like, because they want to go back to the non -say. But you can actually you build in, instead of if the cell, you find the cells going rogue, then you can actually build and kill systems. So that you can actually, if you're concerned about it, then you can actually build in systems such that if you gave a small molecule drug, it would trigger the cells to die. Obviously, so you can build in that kind of, um, uh, so you can be confident that they're not going to go completely rogue, basically. As far as how they resilient to how long they will last in the body, how long they will keep functioning as you hope, this is a massive area of research. You know, this this is where engineering biology comes in. You need to build in those those circuits to try and keep them stable and doing what you hope they do. And that's that's part of the research programs that a lot of us in engineering biology are doing at the minute. Can I ask a follow up on that. I'm just because I'm interested on the kill switch, like you're saying. So and I'm just thinking about the millions and millions of cells, say, in the body. So how do you how do you design the kill switch so it's like probability of one you're going to shut down the cell and, and as we're getting back to the evolution point you don't end up with zero you know zero point zero 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 one percent survival rate sounds really low until you have such a large number of cells and instead those rogue cells evolve and actually progress yeah so you put in more than one kill switch in okay in one cell. you wouldn't rely on just one so put redundancy, redundancy in. Okay. you build that into the system i was just thinking of uh Watching Jurassic Park with my kids, which yeah. probably doesn't be bad, <laughs> which is exactly the problem. Question: yeah. <laughs> Chaos, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> Just in numbers. So we have a question in our audience. Sure. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, so um, it seems to me that sometimes in engineering there is a little bit of a tension between resilience and performance. Uh, you know, Formula One car may not be the most robust around, and the most robust car in our street may not be the most performant. So I was wondering whether in the technology you're developing, you also find this difficulty in trying to combine really novel designs and novel technology with the issue of resilience. And if so, how do you find a sweet spot trying to combine the two? And I think it could be for all, for all of you or any of you who would like to, to answer this. Happy to quick start which is it's not just that um resilience performance it's also cost and numbers and i think a real trick is finding a sweet spot application where you can start developing the new technology and people are willing or it's a specific example which has much higher impact or cost acceptable and then develop it and then spread it so a lot of the technologies in a formula one car end up in your average sedan and it's just that matter of doing it so i think that's something that we should be doing and we do do in healthcare as well that's i'll like take that analogy and kind of map it into the clinical trial structure that we use so you know the formula one car is on a confined racetrack and so we kind of explore push the maximum performance but within a very controlled space and so that tends to be the structure that we use in developing you know, the novel technologies is we'll try out an algorithm, but it will be in the clinic surrounded by trained medical professionals. And we actually design in the emergency shutoffs, the fallback modes and the like, but it's very, very contained. And so we work with the regulators to kind of agree on that translation plan of first, we take it to the racetrack, the analog being the clinic under very careful supervision, usually several days in the hospital. Then even in some cases, it's been a transition where they're in a hotel across the street from the hospital, still a nurse on standby, and then eventually into the home. So 
that trade-off is absolutely there, but I think that's actually where as engineers working with the medics, we can actually structure a phased approach, just like you're saying, from the Formula One track eventually into the um, everyday car for the family and just being very thoughtful about that uh, transition plan. Yeah, I think just, just to give a couple of examples, I think it's adding to what was said before, but um, <clears throat> one of the devices where I work is in, in flow diversion devices in brain aneurysms. And the first devices that were built, the stents were coronary stents that were repurposed for the brain because there was a whole regulatory approval already done and <clears throat> it was less complex. But what uh, initially wasn't realized is that the, the stents in the coronaries actually tend to be open cells. So they're not symmetric. So you have places where the strut close and where they don't. And it turned out that when you put it in the brain, depending on your particular rotation angle in which you were inserting, that is very difficult to control because you know surgeons, interventions do that under image guidance and with you know, catheters. Then if the strut that was open was ending in the neck or was the other one, you will have a very different performance. So you might have thought that <clears throat> if you don't account for that uncertainty in that case of um, not only the device, but the delivery system and the, the whole procedure, if you don't look at it as a system, you would have the wrong estimates of performance. And incidentally, all of those predictions could have been made through models relatively easily. In fact, we, we did that work. Um, so I think it's, it's realizing that it boils down to what Tim was saying, that we tend to only test devices in a very small set. And then when we put them in the open population, then that needs to be, is, is, a, is an all weather conditions that, that you're testing. Um, so in the end, resilient, I think is equivalent to performance, at least when you look at um, you know, the real situation in the market as opposed to your testing conditions, right? Um, the other thing is that if you understand what are the conditions under which your device in this case performs poorly, you can stratify the therapy in this case to different, different scenarios. Um, so hopefully that... Mm. I love that Formula One analogy. Any other questions? Yeah. Really, tonight you've been talking primarily to a to technical audience or an engineering audience. These areas of uh, potential healthcare impact are going to have an impact on the wider population. Do you think there's more we ought to be doing as a community to increase the likely acceptance of these novel techniques as they emerge? Uh, you know, how soon do we need to make sure that we're raising the awareness of what these things can do uh, and what the pros and cons are? so that you don't get resistance at the point at which you've really made that breakthrough and it could come into into use that's really for anybody you know it's more we should be doing yeah of course absolutely it's, it's extremely important you know in my area we're very conscious of um what happened with um the genetically engineered crops you know and be very keen to avoid doing that so you know i run a synthetic biology center and a lot of the we've got social scientists as engaged with our center as we have engineers chemists biologists and it's absolutely vital that we look at when we're doing the research we think about how our research impacts on society and also how society impacts on our research because society as a whole comes up with a regulatory system so we're very very conscious of it, we're very aware of it we do quite a lot of public engagement stuff we go out into schools we engage with all the science fairs we, we try and we, we engage with artists we've done quite a lot of work with artists as well so we, we try and engage with the population in a whole wide range of ways as best we can and it, it is absolutely vital yeah, I, I can pick up actually thinking about i hear from my accent i i was in, not in the eu when the when the gene questions were coming up and I was in a different culture and it was the way it was also framed. So I think one of our responsibilities as a community is to think very carefully about how we frame this. So genetic crops were brought up in my environment about talking about how corn was basically managed by humanity over many millennia to get the corn that we eat today and that this is a continuum. And it's, part of this is to frame the technologies and the interventions in a way that people can appreciate both the concerns, but also some of a way to think about the role of technology compared to the world around them. And what I find in terms of engaging the 
the uh, potential patient populations. In fact, I just went through this um, with some pediatricians in London talking about brain implants for epilepsy. We also need to be clear about what the technology can't do in terms of medicine, especially with the brain implants. The concerns from the children were, will my parents be able to read my mind? Will you be able to control me remotely? And these are actually very valid questions. And we have to remember many people in the broader society, they're watching science fiction, which inspires many of us, but also raises concerns. They watch Black Mirror, um, some other sci-fi that goes into a darker place. And I think that's also where we have a responsibility to say what the limitations are for the technology, including the limitations we're putting in place to try to assuage some of their fears. I think uh, we did, some of our social scientists did a lot of work in, you know, with, with different populations. And one of the interesting things that came out of that work was that the, the general public they engaged with were far more positive about engineering biology in the healthcare context than any other context, because they could see the potential benefits for them and their families of it. And so that was quite encouraging, actually. And it's all about the framing of the benefits and the risks. We see the same on brain implants, the appetite for, say, treating epilepsy versus, say, you know, participating on social media, typing faster. There's definitely different opinions on work. On that note, then, um, do we need to focus more on interdisciplinarity? I would say so, but, but not only the interdisciplinarity within engineering or within engineering and science mm. and, and the traditional science, but also in terms of, for instance, how our technologies link to the healthcare provision, the health economics, for instance, the elements of ethics, um, the elements of communication, the science as well. I think that's also very important because um, we all have a bias from our own uh, disciplines and understanding uh, and also a bias from, you know, having a certain type of education and training that also makes difficult sometimes to put yourself in the other disciplines and, and how the general uh, people um, may perceive certain things. So I think that's certainly important to, um, you know, to provide a more, a more um, balanced perspective. Uh, I need to say, coming from, you know, from also from another country where this happens less, I, I, I tend to think that the the way in which in the UK um, certain uh, broadcasting programs that try to disseminate science, uh, try to explain and the quality and the level at which some of the, 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 you know, the average understanding of science happens in the UK, that, that is very important um, because otherwise you can create a lot of extra barriers to the technologies both to be adopted and therefore benef you know, benefit from it, but also in terms of concerns and worries, maybe just completely unfounded, but, but you know, nevertheless they have a they, they can create anxiety or concerns in people. Um, so that, that to us and leads also is very important to, to engage with um, the general public in, in, in that way and also with patient uh, groups, um, <clears throat> but also, as I said, with, with social scientists to, to have a, a sort of more systemic perspective on the concerns as well. Mm, I wholeheartedly so agree with that. Final say, words for you, Peter. Interdisciplinary, yeah. I think it's fundamental to resilience. You know, we talked about how you have millions of different types of cells going through. It's because of the diversity of us that we're able to have the healthcare. And we need that diversity of different medical, biological, engineering, physics, imaging, all working together to do new healthcare techniques. Mm. Well, a great note to end on. Uh, collaboration is key. And we have heard from many different approaches and perspectives from our panel today on resilient healthcare and the role of engineering in meeting societal needs in times of adversity. These technologies have the potential to secure long lasting and positive changes to a resilient healthcare system. What an interesting discussion. Thank you all so much. And I hope that this has an impact in encouraging more collaboration and interdiscipline and um, at the very least, an appreciation for the different essential roles engineers play in healthcare. For more information on this discussion and the Academy strategy and the chairs in emerging technologies program, please visit the Academy website. Thank you all so much for joining and for your participation as a live audience. And we look forward to seeing you again 
in future Academy events.